This anime starts with an ugly loser masochistic mage who was given a last chance to live. He tried to fight using his weak magic, but everyone just laughed at him. In this world, being born into the right family, having natural talent, and working hard are what really matter to become a powerful magician. Sadly, no matter how much he tried, he couldn't make up for not being naturally talented. The noble told him magic would never work for him, and with a real magic spell, he ended his life faster than your father who left you. As he burned, he couldn't help but admire the spell, seeing it as something beautiful that only nobles could do. His dying wish was just to know more about magic, even if he couldn't use it well himself. But as he thought it was all over, he suddenly woke up surrounded by huge giants. Scared, he tried to defend himself with a tiny fireball. But surprisingly, even with tiny hands, his fireball attack managed to work. Outside, there was a huge celebration as it was announced that the seventh prince of the Salon Kingdom had been born. Our ugly loser had been reborn as Prince Lloyd, and everyone was shocked to see the damage the little baby's fireball had caused. Years later, Lloyd had grown a bit, but he's currently hiding from his maids. A knight then invites him to go on a raid, but he was too busy trying to escape from the maids. The knights then decided to leave him be, as unfortunately, being much younger than his brothers, Lloyd was out of contention for the crown. One of the knights didn't think it was worth gaining the kid's favor, but the other knight disagreed strongly. He believed Lloyd was amazing, as he was able to speak shortly after birth, and he preferred spell books instead of picture books. He also refused to drink milk straight from Mount Everest itself, like a true gentleman. But most importantly, this knight believed Lloyd might be the reincarnation of the great mage known as William Bordeaux, the father of sorcery. Lloyd confirmed that he was indeed reborn, although he was just a commoner in his past life. He had no clue why he was reborn into the privileged position of the seventh son of the royal family. Regardless, Lloyd didn't care about standing or glory. He followed the same philosophy he had in his past life. Discovering the wonders of magic in the world was all that mattered to him. In his new life, Lloyd is granted access to a vast library, perfect to immerse himself in. However, his studies are interrupted by Sofa, his teacher, who challenges him to a sparring match. However, Lloyd doubted the necessity of swordsmanship since he's not in line for the throne. But Silpha insists that royal succession isn't everything and reminds him of her duty to educate him. Lloyd realizes that the practice won't stop until he puts up a good fight, so he engages with more determination. Using his control-type magic, Lloyd secretly traces Silpha's moves, essentially fighting her with her own techniques. Despite his cheating, Lloyd recognizes Silpha's superiority in strength, stamina, and height. He decides to experiment using a physical enhancement and levitation spell to level the playing field. With a combination of physical attacks and magic, Lloyd fights more evenly. As the battle intensifies, Lloyd grows confident, believing he can win by making one different move. Releasing his trace spell, Lloyd surprises Silpha with an unexpected maneuver. However, she blocks the attack and reveals she knew he was cheating all along. She points out his use of levitation to compensate for his height disadvantage and even grow in his wooden sword. Exhausted, Lloyd apologizes for ending the fight abruptly, eager to return to his books. Though surprised by Silpha's sharpness, he remains determined, always seeking to push the boundaries of his magical knowledge. Silpha's anger instantly transforms into admiration as she's amazed to witness Lloyd's ability to use two spells simultaneously, a feat even the palace magicians struggle with. Little does she know, Lloyd is actually employing four spells, keeping the additional ones hidden from her notice. He wonders about her potential shock if she ever discovered his true capabilities but decides to keep it a secret for now. Later. Lloyd is forced into taking a bath despite his intense desire to continue reading. The maids caution him against spending too much time in the library, warning him of a forbidden library's demon, Grimoire, rumored to devour those who linger too long. They tell a story about Salem's near destruction in the past, following the sacrifice of numerous mages serving as a grim reminder of the demon's menace. Though Silpha doubts that Lloyd would be scared, he secretly trembles with curiosity at the thought of an ancient demon. Amidst the maid's debate over who will comfort the frightened Lloyd, he seizes the opportunity to slip away. Unbeknownst to them, Lloyd's fear isn't of the demon, but rather his excitement at the prospect of discovering the forbidden library hidden in the castle's basement. Under the cover of night, Lloyd employs wind and magic to cloak himself in invisibility, slipping past the guards who underestimate the dangers within the forbidden library. Despite the ten mages' powerful sealing spells, Lloyd effortlessly breaches the barrier, entering the forbidden room. Inside, he marvels at the Forbidden Library's contents, briefly inspecting its ancient toms. However, his exploration is abruptly interrupted as Grimoire, the sealed demon, reveals itself, catching Lloyd off guard. Lloyd confidently introduces himself to Grimoire, prompting the demon to consider whether the boy could be persuaded to break his seal. Recognizing the weakened state of the seal, 
Grimoire attempts to trick Lloyd with promises of endless wealth. However, Lloyd sees through the demon's facade, noting the poor quality of its imitation magic. Maintaining his composure, Wood explains his dedication to studying magic in the kingdom, refusing to let a dangerous demon ruin his dreams. Despite Grimoire's assurances of harboring no ill intent toward the present inhabitants, Lloyd remains skeptical. However, when Grimoire offers to teach him ancient lost magic, Lloyd starts to get interested, recognizing the value in such knowledge. Lloyd then lifts the seal, hoping to learn ancient magic in return, but Grimoire launches a devastating attack. To Grimoire's surprise, Lloyd survives and marvels at the unique attack, eager to learn more. Despite Grimoire's furious onslaught, Lloyd remains calm, using his barrier to analyze each attack. Driven by his fascination with magic, Lloyd willingly endures the pain of Grimoire's assaults, determined to understand their intricacies. Grimoire is stunned when Lloyd channels the magic into his finger, demonstrating his deep appreciation for its beauty, even amidst the agony. Lloyd, intrigued by Grimoire's ancient magic, requests for more. Enraged, Grimoire summons an even more potent spell, utilizing the rare ability to synchronize two incantations simultaneously, a feat only possible for demons with two mouths. Despite Grimoire's secret technique, his most formidable magic fails to even scratch Lloyd's barrier. Lloyd admires the effort it must have taken to reach such power. But as Grimoire attempts to flee, he's shocked to find Lloyd has erected another barrier. And Lloyd explains it's a precaution born from past mistakes, displaying his foresight. Grimoire quickly prepares for another assault, but Lloyd, finished analyzing, powers up his own spell, demanding Grimoire to demonstrate his defensive abilities. With a massive fire attack, Lloyd one-shots Grimoire, who marvels at the source of Lloyd's immense mana. Lloyd then effortlessly restored the devastated room, which made Grimoire awestruck, acknowledging Lloyd as his master. In all of Lloyd's power, Grimoire offers to serve as his familiar to avoid enduring endless pain from Lloyd's tests. Thus, Grimoire pledges himself to the remarkable mage, now known as Master Lloyd. To avoid being found out, Grimoire transforms into the cutest animal he can muster, concealing his true intentions beneath his adorableness. He's hoping that Lloyd will eventually lower his guard, providing an opportunity to strike. Lloyd then instructs him to hop into his pocket and Grimoire sees it as a foolish decision, but he complies nonetheless, intending to exploit Lloyd to seize control of his mind and body. However, Grimoire's plans are put to an end when he senses the density of Lloyd's mana, realizing he's facing a being beyond his understanding. Trembling in fear, Grimoire questions Lloyd's humanity, shattering his confidence. In a desperate attempt to butter up the powerful mage, Grimoire quickly changes his tune, suggesting Lloyd simply call him Grim. Acknowledging the temporary defeat of his ambitions, Grimoire resolves to be obedient for the time being as Lloyd happily goes off to indulge in his reading. The next day, as the noble Prince Albert prepares for his day, he navigates through the mansion. However, Grim warns Lloyd of the approaching presence and Lloyd instructs Grim to hide. Turns out the visitor was Prince Albert, the second prince of the Sound Kingdom. Albert then demonstrated his exceptional magical prowess, effortlessly hitting targets with precision astounding everyone in the training range. Despite his own magical talents, Lloyd prefers to remain in the background, uninterested in the throne. However, he appreciates Albert's occasional invitations to facilities like the range, where he can practice his magic freely. When it's Lloyd's turn to demonstrate, he tries to stay low-key, not wanting to draw attention from the bystanders. Instead of showcasing his full power, Lloyd skillfully manipulates his fireball spells to slightly graze the targets. Though the spectators were disappointed by Lloyd's modest display, Grimm understands the incredible difficulty of controlling magic with such precision. Lloyd paid no attention to the spectators' comments, and instead focuses on improving his techniques. Albert, however, seems to know something, but he doesn't say anything and leaves to take a break, allowing Lloyd to train as much as he wants. Grateful for the opportunity, Lloyd eagerly sets out to explore new magic techniques. His first challenge is attempting the dual incantation, a feat previously thought impossible for humans. Initially, Grimm warns him of the danger, as this ability can only be performed by demons with multiple mouths. However, Lloyd surprises himself by successfully executing the technique, incorporating Grimm into his own body. However, upon entering his body, Grimm realizes Lloyd is capable of reciting a hundred spells at once, far surpassing even the most powerful demon's capabilities. Lloyd then explains his method called as spell stacking, where he compresses multiple incantations into a single line to shorten casting time. As Lloyd tests his new abilities, he discovers that he can speak through both mouths simultaneously, causing Grimm to panic. However, Lloyd calmly silences him while continuing to channel an immense power as he combines Infernal Fireball and Water Bolt spells. 
Witnessing the surge of mana, Grimm's panic peaks, realizing Lloyd is weaving together two incredibly advanced spells. Unable to contain the power on his own, Lloyd redirects it into the sky, which creates a breathtaking display visible throughout the castle. Despite doubts from some servants about Lloyd's magical abilities, Albert sees through his stage performance, recognizing Lloyd's hidden talent. He envisions Lloyd growing up to become the Grand Sage and hopes to have him as an ally in the future. The servants praise Albert for being able to make long-term plans, but Albert clarifies that he just wanted to get along with his little brother. He predicts that Lloyd has likely already knocked down all the targets, but Albert's words are met with skepticism from the servants, who doubt Lloyd's abilities once again. Suddenly, the sky outside turned dark, which confused everyone in the kingdom. The reason becomes clear as Grimm trembles in fear, having witnessed Lloyd blasting a hole through the atmosphere with his advanced magic. Panicking, Lloyd desperately tries to keep the incident under control and is quickly relieved when things return to normal. The following morning, news of the hole in the sky makes it into the newspaper, but the cause remains a mystery to all. Grimm grows frustrated with his infinite household duties for Lloyd but reminds himself of his ultimate goal, ensuring Lloyd's well-being for when he eventually takes over his body. Meanwhile, Lloyd's attention has already shifted to a new story about high-ranking adventurers who conquered a challenging dungeon, returning with valuable treasures and magical items. Intrigued, Lloyd decides he wants to explore a dungeon himself. However, Grimm warns that his disappearance would likely cause mass panic if discovered. Lloyd then reveals a solution to Grimm's concerns, where he uses a corn to create a lifelike wooden replica of himself. Grimm watches as the replica moves and acts like Lloyd, thanks to nerves and other intricate details Lloyd incorporated into it. However, Lloyd acknowledges that this won't fool Silpha, who obsesses over him to the point of noticing small details like his daily height increase. To address this, Lloyd transfers Grimm's soul into the replica and keeps control of his body through his hand, leaving the maids charmed with its cuteness. With Grimm now in charge of the body double, Lloyd heads outside, leaving the rest to Grimm. However, Grimm's mind starts to wander with his newfound freedom as he starts to plan his grand scheme. But suddenly, Lloyd expresses his appreciation for having Grimm as his familiar which touched his heart. As Lloyd realizes that he doesn't know where to find a dungeon, Grimm notices someone being chased by some creatures who seemed like your mother. As the helpless girl runs, she suddenly turns the tables on her pursuers and defeats them with remarkable skill. Grimm notices her talent and identifies her as a martial artist. Lloyd also recognizes the breathing technique she employs which allows the users to harness an energy called Ki, granting them incredible strength. Despite watching the girl from afar, the girl somehow spots Lloyd and Grimm. Grimm then warns Lloyd that she may recognize him as the seventh prince, sparking panic in Lloyd. To avoid being recognized, Lloyd quickly changes his appearance using a spell that allows him to transform into someone he's seen before. And with his newly learned dual incantation, Lloyd combines his appearance with Albert's to create a unique look. He then introduces himself as Alberto and the girl also introduces herself as Tao. While Lloyd worries about Tao suspecting something, it turns out that she is actually in a panic because she finds Alberto attractive. Tao then explains that she spent her entire life training and recently became an adventurer in search of romance, though she's had little success due to her martial prowess intimidating potential partners. Despite Tao's initial intentions, she eagerly accepts Lloyd's invitation to explore a dungeon together. Inside the dungeon, Tao showcases her combat skills, while Lloyd is fixated on glowing rocks. They then decide to take a break where they cook themselves a meal. Lloyd then questions Tao about Ki, which shocks Tao as not a lot of people know what Ki is. She explains that mastery of Ki begins and ends with proper breathing techniques. These techniques fill the body with Ki, which helps the users to unleash bursts of superhuman strength. Tao, and suggests that instead of focusing on mastering this technique, Alberto should concentrate on winning her heart. However, Lloyd ignores this and surprises Tao by successfully mimicking her breathing technique, though she warns him of the intense burning sensation it may cause if he's not used to it. Excited by this newfound power, he eagerly accepts Tao's offer to teach him more about Ki, committing to practicing the technique until they leave the dungeon. Meanwhile, Grimm, on the other hand, is baffled by Lloyd's single-minded pursuit of magic despite his privileged life and finds himself shocked when Silpha appears behind him. In the dungeon, Tao demonstrates a key blast, defeating the dungeon boss with ease. They receive a chest as a reward, but Tao explains that a dungeon with minimal growth won't give valuable loot. While examining the chest, Tao is astonished to see Alberto has already learned the key breathing technique in such a short time, realizing the potential benefits of having Alberto as her fiancé. She then opens the chest, only to trigger a deadly trap. As a menacing foe emerges, Lloyd wonders if it's the true boss of the dungeon. 
Standing face to face with the dungeon boss, Tao urges Loy to leave while she handles the monster. However, Lloyd is determined to stay and witness her defeat this creature. However, without any warning, Tal unleashes her technique, blasting Lloyd out of the cave in hopes that he'll safely reach the dungeon entrance, albeit with a few bruises. As the boss turns its attention to Tao, she evades its attacks, pondering why such a formidable enemy appeared in a low-level dungeon. Recognizing the boss's strength, Ta realizes it will be a tough opponent even for an A-rank adventurer. Determined to buy time for Lloyd's escape, Ta focuses on dodging the boss's never-ending onslaught. On the other hand, after getting propelled by the blast, Lloyd flies through the dungeon. He's salty that he was forced to leave, as he still had a lot of questions about Ki. He then creates a barrier to slow his momentum before eventually coming to a stop. Unsure why Ta sent him away, Lloyd seeks Grimm's advice but receives no response until Grimm, in a small voice, tells him to return quickly, begging for his help. Back in the cave, Ta realizes she can't defeat the boss alone and decides to retreat slowly. However, the boss notices her use of Ki and reveals that he had consumed his fair share of people with similar skills in the past, gaining their knowledge. Dismissing Ta as unworthy of consumption, the boss expresses interest in Lloyd due to his swift reflexes, capable of dodging its attacks. As Ta confronts the boss, it somehow reminded her of Lloyd. However, despite their shared pursuit of knowledge, Lloyd and the boss are vastly different. She's impressed that Lloyd recognizes the importance of Ki and its potential power. Determined to defeat the boss, Tal unleashes her Ki attack, only to find it blocked by a barrier. Refusing to let the boss get the best of her years of training, Ta pushes herself to break through the barrier, unleashing a powerful energy beam that hits the boss. Exhausted from using all of her power, Ta collapses, unable to move. However, the boss levitates above her and prepares to unleash a spell that surpasses her key energy. As he unleashes his attack, Lloyd suddenly appears beside Tao, protecting her with a barrier. Disappointed by Tao's surrender, Lloyd assures her he'll handle the boss. As the boss prepares an incantation, Lloyd effortlessly maneuvers behind him and uses a combination of key and magic techniques. Despite the boss's relentless attacks, Lloyd's barrier holds strong. Remembering Tao's advice, Lloyd focuses on his breathing, inhaling deeply and using a sprint spell to accelerate the process. With determination, Lloyd moves through the cave, trying to absorb as much air as possible. As the boss attempts to attack Lloyd, his magic is unable to beat the unstoppable force. Meanwhile, Lloyd focuses on his breathing technique, inhaling and exhaling deeply to build up key energy. Ta watches in amazement as Lloyd's determination grows, but Lloyd soon realizes that his barrier is obstructing his breathing. With a quick decision, he dispels the barrier, much to the boss's surprise. Swinging onto the rocks to support himself, Lloyd continues his breathing exercises, dodging the boss's attacks with agility. Ta realizes that Lloyd purposely dispelled his barrier to improve his breathing and build up more key energy. Combining key with his mana, Lloyd unleashes a series of strikes, disappointed when they fail to defeat the boss. Determined, he refines his technique, making his strikes sharper and thinner. In a last-ditch effort, the boss erects a barrier to shield himself, but Lloyd's strike pierces, cuts the boss in half, ultimately defeating the boss. A treasure chest then appears, Ta is disappointed with the treasure inside, but Lloyd decides to keep the dagger, as he sends residual mana within it. However, the chest suddenly sinks into the ground, prompting Lloyd to grab hold of it. After learning that the chest is the dungeon's core, he realized that the chest's purpose was to consume magic items, absorb equipment dropped by adventurers, and create new dungeons. With this knowledge, it suddenly sparked a brilliant idea in his little mind. They narrowly evade disaster as the dungeon collapses around them, but Lloyd remains fascinated by the chest's function. Ta then questions Lloyd's use of his key techniques, suspecting it was to retaliate against the boss's mockery of her, but Lloyd reassures her it was simply for his enjoyment. In her mind, she reveals that the final attack Lloyd used was a secret key blast technique, something even she is not capable of. Not wanting to be bested by Lloyd, Ta promises to train herself in order to become stronger. As Lloyd flies away, she vows to become a girl worthy of getting Lloyd's attention. Upon returning home, Lloyd finds Grimoire battered from training with Silpha. Grimoire blames Lloyd for his current state, but Lloyd apologizes nonetheless. The next day, they experiment with the dagger Lloyd retrieved, discovering its mana essence that is capable of enhancing weapons. However, Lloyd is cautious, knowing mana essence is scarce and enchantments are very risky. Instead of risking the dagger, he opts to analyze its essence to potentially replicate it. Lloyd uses a spell to separate the mana essence from the blade, which resulted in oil, silver, and something called hematide. Grimoire, however, recognizes the hematide as something rare, which was a special powder from a monster's core. Lloyd then tells Grimoire that they can make more hematide using the chest they got from the dungeon. 
Lloyd is happy because now they have everything they need to make mana essence. He then asks his dad for help, and his dad gives him a lot of silver coins. They then melt the silver into liquid in the ancient library. Later, Lloyd and Silpha spar together. He tries to surprise her with magic, but Silpha outsmarts his little trick and hits him back. Even though Lloyd tried everything he could, Silpha still wins. However, after the fight, Silpha still gives Lloyd some oil. She tells him that it's okay because she's happy that he's not weak, referring to his performance the other day. She then came to the conclusion that Lloyd was just having a bad day. Grimoire, on the other hand, wonders how Silpha always wins, even when Lloyd uses his magic. Then Lloyd, with Grimoire's help, creates mana essence from the oil, silver, and hematide. He then seeks Prince Albert's assistance to help with his little experiment. Prince Albert then ordered the royal guards to provide their swords, allowing Lloyd to begin enchanting. However, during his first try, he overloads the sword with spells, causing it to break. Determined, he continues his little experiment, ultimately enchanting 50 out of 120 swords successfully. When Lloyd presents his results to his brother, Prince Albert is surprised that Lloyd successfully enchanted 50 out of 120 weapons. Lloyd, however, apologizes for the 70 swords that broke, revealing some mishaps during his experiment. In his mind, Prince Albert is impressed because even the best enchanter in the world can only successfully enchant 10% of their weapons. The guards, on the other hand, think that Lloyd is lying, which makes Silpha mad. But when one guard tries to put away his sword, it cuts through the scabbard like butter, revealing its authenticity. Lloyd then asks Prince Albert to see the weapons in action, and his brother agrees inviting him to go on a monster hunt with them. As Prince Albert and Lloyd travel in a carriage driven by Silpha, Lloyd dozes off with Grumoir in his lap while Albert occupies himself with a book. Upon waking up, Lloyd notices some farmers sparking his interest in observing people's daily lives. And as they enter the forest for their monster hunt, Lloyd wonders if monsters are common there, but Silpha explains they only mainly appear near a nearby lake. Excited to be on the expedition, Lloyd shares his enthusiasm for seeing his enchanted swords in action. Observing Lloyd's excitement, Albert acknowledges Silpha's attentive gaze on Lloyd. She then tells him that she appreciates being included in the expedition, as she feels responsible for Lloyd's safety, revealing that it would be normal for her to worry because she's Lloyd's mentor. However, Albert suggests that there might be another reason she's concerned, teasing her about their relationship. Silpha reacts by drawing her sword, causing Albert to quickly take back his words. Suddenly, she interrupts to alert them of unexpected guests, kobolds armed with steel weapons. While the guards protect the carriage, Lloyd pretends to be frightened, though Grumor is seized through his act. Lloyd admits he detected the ambush using Tao's key technique, spectral detection, which allows him to be constantly aware of his surroundings through key breathing. Grumor, however, realizes Lloyd's constant use of detection and barrier techniques, acknowledging his growing power. Lloyd focuses on the battle as the guards engage the kobolds, easily cutting them like butter, which surprises the guards themselves. Pleased with the enchantment's success, Lloyd observes how sharp the swords are, which made Albert proudly acknowledge Lloyd's genius and skill. Hearing this, Silpha also acknowledges Lloyd's excellence, standing atop a heap of defeated enemies. This frightened Lloyd as he knew she relied solely on her strength since he hadn't enchanted her sword. Suddenly, a kobold leaps out to attack the carriage, but Ta intercepts it mid-air, surprising everyone. She explains she sensed the monsters nearby and came to help. Lloyd almost accidentally calls out Ta's name, forgetting he's not currently in disguise. Ta then approaches him, noticing that he's using key breathing techniques and mistakes him for Alberto, his previous disguise. However, Silpha swiftly takes down a kobold going for Ta, warning her not to cause more trouble. But Ta defends herself, saying she was aware of the kobold due to her key techniques, leading to tension between her and Silpha. Seeing this, Albert quickly intervenes to ease the tension. He then suggests that they all bond by spending time together at the lake. As they arrive, he thanks Ta for ensuring their safe arrival and introduces himself as the second prince of Salam. Surprised, Ta apologizes for her earlier behavior and tries to locate Lloyd, still suspicious of him. Meanwhile, Lloyd hides behind a tent, realizing Ta was able to locate him using spectral detection. He then decides to stay quiet to avoid suspicion. As soon as she enters his tent, he is met with the top two tallest mountains in the world. But somehow, this actually annoyed Lloyd who asked why she was changing in his tent. Silpha then tells him that she's assigned to protect Lloyd, which includes spending the night with him. Suddenly, Ta walks in, catching them off guard. As soon as she enters, Silpha attacks Ta, but she evades the blow. They then argue while Lloyd takes the opportunity to slip away, finding the atmosphere more suffocating, even when he's not at the castle. Albert teases Lloyd about his playboy reputation and mentions Silpha's changed behavior since she was assigned to him. 
Silfa, on the other hand, questions how Tao found them, but Tao insists that she used her key senses, a claim Silfa doubts. Albert then warns Lloyd about the dangers of relationships with women, emphasizing that it can be horrifying. Meanwhile, Tao and Silfa continue to engage in their argument, drawing the attention of the guards who end up being beaten by the two of them. After their argument, Tao then informs Silfa of her task to repair a chapel on a nearby hill. However, concerned for her safety, Albert suggests that she stay with them for the night to keep watch. But not long after, their plans are instantly interrupted by the sudden appearance of a bear wolf. Seeing this, Silfa urges Lloyd to stay behind her as they prepare to face the creature. Observing the wolf's agility, Lloyd seeks Grimoire's opinion, but notices Grimoire's unusual behavior. Grimoire seems to be preoccupied with thoughts about the rundown chapel, leaving Lloyd puzzled. As the wolf attacks the guards, Tao intervenes with her key strike to save one of them. But despite her efforts, the wolf continues its assault, prompting Albert to use his enchanted fire aspect sword, shooting out a powerful fireball spell that defeats the wolf and prevents harm to the nearby village. The guards are impressed by Albert's swift defeat of the wolf, but Albert credits Lloyd for enhancing his spell with the enchantment. Lloyd is pleased with the success of his enchantment on Albert's sword, and Grimoire recalls that the chapel on the hill once sealed a demon, piquing Lloyd's interest. Suddenly, the supposedly defeated bear wolf rises again, accompanied by more monsters summoned by Pazuzu, the demon. Angry at their presence, Pazuzu commands the monsters to attack. But despite Albert's attempts to fight them off, their rapid healing abilities made the fight seem impossible. Ta realizes the dire situation due to the monster's regeneration. While Albert admits that he's never faced such monsters before, knowing that even some are hybrids, he then came to the conclusion that Pazuzu is somehow manipulating them. Lloyd then asks Grimoire whether he is acquainted with Pazuzu, but Grimoire clarifies that he doesn't know the demon personally and explains its method of controlling monsters by infusing them with mana, enhancing their regeneration. He reveals that they have to focus on defeating the demon before they're trapped in an endless battle, but Lloyd is intrigued by the idea of learning mana transmutation. Grimoire initially hesitates, warning that it might not be the right moment with everyone fighting for their lives. On the other side, Silfa mocks Tao's inability to defeat the monsters, but Tao fires back, criticizing Silfa for not taking action herself. The demon then taunts Lloyd for hiding behind everyone else, which infuriates Silfa, who goes to confront the demon directly. Disgusted by the demon's arrogance, Silfa refuses its offer to join its ranks and decides to end its life. But, the demon keeps on boasting about its ability to regenerate monsters fueled by mana. Confident in her skills, Silfa strikes the bear wolf, dismembering the demon's host monster, causing the others to struggle with regeneration. Observing this distraction, Albert realizes their chance to defeat the other monsters is to attack them while the main demon is preoccupied with healing itself. He then instructs Silfa to focus solely on damaging the demon, allowing the others an opportunity to take down the remaining monsters. As Grimoire continues Lloyd's mana lesson, he emphasizes how difficult it is to master the technique, even for demons who spend years trying to perfect the skill. He instructs Lloyd to start by altering the color, shape, and scent of his mana. But Lloyd quickly impresses Grimoire by creating a perfect flower with a distinct fragrance, surprising even himself with his rapid progress. Meanwhile, Silfa faces off against the demon, borrowing an enchanted sword borrowed from one of the guards. Despite the demon's relentless attacks, Silfa's defense remains flawless, making the demon question why such a formidable fighter would choose to be a maid. However, the demon proceeds to mock Lloyd, believing humans to be vulnerable when emotional. It then attacks Silfa, using the bear wolf to swallow her whole. However, Silfa surprises everyone by utilizing a secret language's technique, tearing the demon apart from within its host monster. With the demon exposed, Silfa confronts its grotesque form, showcasing her unparalleled strength, which scares everyone in the vicinity. Seeing this, Lloyd realizes that Silfa is a force to be reckoned with, especially when she's serious. She then continues to advance the demon and tells him that the closest thing he'll get to Lloyd will only be his sword. Silfa confronts Pazuzu, urging him to surrender now that she has defeated him. However, Pazuzu only scoffs at her boldness and releases a poisonous mana from his mouth, enveloping the area, impairing Silfa's vision. While the knights celebrate their victory over the monsters, Albert reminds them that they still haven't defeated the demon. As the poisonous mana spreads, the knights start to lose consciousness, except for Tao, who manages to avoid inhaling it. Unfortunately, Silfa falls to the poison, collapsing before Pazuzu. Angered by the defeat of his monsters, Pazuzu attacks Silfa, sending her crashing into a nearby tree. Though Albert tries to help her, he finds himself immobilized, unable to move at all. Pazuzu then reveals that anyone who breathes in his mana will fall under his control, explaining why Albert and the others are paralyzed. 
Sofa finally realizes the source of the foul odor in the air, but before Pazuzu can strike her again, Tao intervenes, shielding Silpha from his attack. Tao then tries to offer her assistance, but Silpha maintains her tough facade, which Tao sees through. However, Silpha insists that Tao should take Lloyd and escape for their lives as she sinks into the lake. Pazuzu praises Silpha's resilience, knowing her fierce determination despite being closest to him when he releases mana. Suddenly, Pazuzu moves swiftly, catching Tao off guard from behind. Surprised by Tao's resistance to his mana, Pazuzu dodges her attacks effortlessly, grabbing her leg in the process. As Pazuzu holds Tao captive, she struggles to maintain her breathing rhythm, distressed by the suffocating effect of his mana. Pazuzu taunts her, suggesting she should seize the opportunity to flee or perhaps even join his ranks. However, Tao boldly rejects his offer, disgusted by the thought of aligning herself with such an ugly, smelly monkey. Instead, she defiantly declares her loyalty to someone she finds attractive, determined not to succumb to Pazuzu's influence. With a surge of determination, Tao channels her key energy, unleashing a powerful electro attack on Pazuzu. However, she realizes it was a mistake to expend so much energy in one blow. Before she can recover, the monsters regenerate and continue their assault on her. Despite the overwhelming odds, Tao remains loyal, refusing to fall to Pazuzu's taunts and determined to protect Lloyd at all costs. Pazuzu tries to convince Tao, boasting about the superiority of his kin due to their ability to regenerate from any damage. He unleashes more of his mana, attempting to seduce Tao into joining his ranks and dedicating her life to him. However, Tao remains strong, sensing someone close by who gives her hope. Curious, Pazuzu asks about this person, and Tao reveals she's referring to her hottie, who she believes will defeat him. Disgusted, Pazuzu loses interest in Tao, dismissing her as a mere dog in heat. Instead, he focuses on corrupting Silpha, intending to make her his eternal slave to compensate for his lost kin. As Pazuzu plots his next move, Lloyd realizes how he's been controlling the bear wolves. Pazuzu confirms Lloyd's suspicions, revealing his cruel methods of manipulation. Lloyd is stunned by the revelation, but Pazuzu is quickly shocked when he notices Lloyd and Grimoire seemingly unaffected by his mana. Questioning why a demon like Grimoire is protecting a human, Pazuzu is confused as he's never seen such a submissive demon before. Pazuzu continues his mockery, taunting Grimoire for his appearance, but Grimoire is angered by the demon's insults. Initially, he considers giving Pazuzu some advice but decides not to, deciding to let Pazuzu face the consequences of his actions. Pazuzu commands his minions to attack Lloyd, presenting an opportunity for Lloyd to attempt mana transformation due to the abundance of monsters. Lloyd knows he needs a substantial amount of mana for this, and but despite his limited control over it, he channels more than enough to create a warm and peaceful atmosphere. The bear wolves are enveloped by Lloyd's mana, allowing him to gain control of the monsters. Lloyd instructs one of the wolves who consume Tao to release her. Impressed by Lloyd's sorcery, Pazuzu releases more mana to regain control, but Grimoire reveals that he has already undone his manipulation of the wolves. The monsters start turn on Pazuzu, attacking him and freeing Silpha. Lloyd, on the other hand, marvels at their coordination and power when led properly. Enraged, Pazuzu strikes down the bear wolves for betraying him, still trying to hide the fact that he sent their parents to the heavens. He then tells Lloyd that his magic will never match that of a demon, repeating Grimoire's earlier warning about the resilience of demons against magic. Pazuzu, aware that he's no longer sharing his mana with the monsters, decides to unleash his full power. Meanwhile, Lloyd is curious about why demons have never fallen to magic and is eager to discover the limits of a demon's resistance. As Lloyd releases his mana, Pazuzu is astonished by what he sees. Grimoire observes that Pazuzu finally understands why his mana didn't affect Lloyd. Lloyd thanks Pazuzu for voluntarily allowing him to test various spells. Realizing that he's doomed, Pazuzu tries to awaken from what he perceives as a nightmare. Lloyd attempts to cast a barrier around Pazuzu, but the demon evades in time, realizing Lloyd's intentions were not to fight but to capture him for experimentation. Desperate to escape, Pazuzu tries his best to flee, dodging Lloyd's barriers and pleading for him to stop. Taking cover behind a rock, Pazuzu tries to catch his breath, only to narrowly evade another barrier cast by Lloyd. Grimoire then wonders how many barriers Lloyd can cast simultaneously, but Lloyd reveals he can conjure 20 at once and potentially more with Grimoire's assistance. Lloyd aggressively casts more barriers, forcing Pazuzu to dodge all of it. Frustrated and disbelieved by Lloyd's ability to maintain so many spells, Pazuzu searches for an opening to escape, but finds himself increasingly cornered by Lloyd's relentless onslaught. In the midst of the chaos, Pazuzu congratulates himself for evading Lloyd's barriers. However, his self-praise is abruptly interrupted when Lloyd ensnares him in his domain expansion. 
Desperate to break free, Pazuzu questions whether Lloyd intends to experiment on him, but Lloyd reminds him of his earlier declaration that magic wouldn't affect him. Lloyd then confronts Pazuzu about his crossbreeding experiments with the bear wolves, which angers him even more. Lloyd exposes Pazuzu for his horrible actions against the monsters, denying him the right to complain. Activating a rapid spell casting technique, Lloyd approaches Pazuzu in his domain expansion. Pazuzu, realizing the magnitude of Lloyd's power, pleads for mercy and offers to fulfill any desires Lloyd may have in exchange for sparing his life. Lloyd, however, absorbed in his magic, pays no attention to Pazuzu's pleas. Unleashing a potent spell combining all four natural elements, Lloyd marvels at his ability to cast 240 spells per minute. Ignoring Pazuzu's, Lloyd wishes to maintain the spell's activation for 30 minutes, captivated by its beauty. Five minutes later, Lloyd calls out to Pazuzu, but he receives no response, sparking fear that the demon may have succumbed to his spells. In his last moments, Pazuzu reflects on how his legacy crumbled in mere minutes despite centuries of preparation. Grimoire then explains to Lloyd that demons possess high resistance to magic, but can be overcome by a relentless barrage of spells. Saddened by his downfall, Pazuzu and Lloyd share a fleeting moment of acknowledgement before Lloyd notices the other's awakening, prompting him to leave to conceal his actions. Rejoining the group, Lloyd fabricates a story about Alberto's intervention in defeating the demon, leaving Tao searching in vain for a glimpse of him. Grimoire, now empowered by Pazuzu's essence, harbors aspirations of defeating Lloyd in a rematch, recognizing that he still has much to learn to rival Lloyd's strength. Upon their return to the castle, the king commands Albert for his role in defeating the demon and its horde, though he warns him for venturing out with only his personal guards. Albert acknowledges his mistakes and updates the king on the adventurers who aided them, noting Alberto's disappearance and Tao's quest for her beloved. Intrigued by Alberto's prowess, the king tries to further gain information, but Albert redirects the conversation to Lloyd's indispensable contribution. He proposes that Lloyd should be allowed to compete for the throne, acknowledging his role in creating weapons that destroyed the monsters. The king acknowledges Lloyd's abilities but expresses concerns about introducing more competition for the throne. Albert reassures the king that he's prepared to lose the throne to someone more deserving, emphasizing the importance of fairness and Lloyd's potential as a ruler. However, he playfully warns Lloyd that he won't surrender easily, setting the stage for a friendly rivalry. When the king asks Lloyd if he's interested in contesting for the throne, Lloyd declines without much emotion. Instead, he went out to the courtyard to play with one of the bear wolves that followed them home. Grimwire, feeling jealous of the bear wolf's closeness to Lloyd, puffs himself up, hoping for some attention from Lloyd too. But his attention shifts when Silpha enters the courtyard. Hastily, he hides Grimoire in the bear wolf's fur, introducing him as Shiro. Silpha then suggests using magic to teach Shiro, which Lloyd wanted to give a try. Meanwhile, inside Shiro's fur, Grimoire is baffled as Lloyd declines the throne offer just so he could focus on magic. The king admires Lloyd's humility for turning down the throne opportunity, but Albert believes Lloyd's destiny may lie beyond their kingdom. Excited about Lloyd's potential, the king eagerly anticipates what he will achieve in the future. Lloyd impresses Silpha with the tricks Shiro can perform, and he's amazed that Shiro was able to learn simple tricks so quickly. When Lloyd attempts to teach Shiro more complex tricks by inscribing them into spells, Shiro always ends up confused and dancing. Lloyd then explains the issue to Silpha, who suggests seeking help from a monster expert, which is when they both think of the same person and decide to visit Princess Alias's tower. Despite Silpha's reluctance, they arrive at the princess's tower with Grimoire hidden in Shiro's fur. Lloyd marvels at the grandeur of the tower, and we soon learn that Elise is Lloyd's elder sister, the sixth princess of Solom, who adores animals of all kinds. Elise eagerly greets Lloyd with an unexpected elbow drop and overwhelms him with affection, hardly letting him get a word in. She proceeds to greet him in Sweet Home Alabama style, which shocks Silpha. Soon after, she notices that Lloyd seems weakened, and she rushes to his aid. Eris the tower maid, however, scolds Elias for her antics, especially for kissing Lloyd, but Elise tells her that she can't resist because Lloyd looks too adorable. Soon after noticing Shiro, Elise wonders if the bear wolf is the reason Lloyd visited her. Lloyd then introduces the bear wolf as Shiro, who was surprised that Elise quickly recognized Shiro's true nature as a bear wolf. Elise, however, claims that her insight was intuitive and attributes it to her animal mana thing. Soon after seeing this, Silpha suggests leaving, doubting Elise's understanding of mana and her ability to teach Lloyd intimate monster communication. But Lloyd decides to stay a bit longer, intrigued by what Elise might offer. He asks Elise about her own monster, and she reveals Lyru, a lesser Fenrir, appearing behind them. 
Silpha's bonnet is snatched by Liru and presented to Elise, showcasing her control over the Fenrir. This made Lloyd marvel at her command, impressed by her ability to communicate without any visible cues. He's eager to learn and asks Elise to teach him to communicate with Shiro as she does with Liru. But Elise warns him it won't be easy and explains that love is the key to monster communication. She then continues to demonstrate it and summons several monsters, emphasizing that love enables anyone to connect with them. Elise hints that her method might not be suitable for Lloyd, considering her magnetic presence for the animals. However, she assures Lloyd that dedication can overcome any obstacle. Demonstrating control over the animals once more, Elise showcases her influence, making both Silpha and Elise uncomfortable. Silpha urges them to leave the tower, expressing her discomfort with using love as a means of control. On the other hand, Lloyd is immersed in thought, realizing he never considered using love in such a way. Seeing this, Silpha daydreams about Lloyd embracing love, envisioning a romantic outcome with the boy. Lloyd then admits that he only tried issuing commands to Shiro and not employing love like Ellie is. Observing Elias's mana affecting the monsters, Lloyd realizes she unconsciously links with them using magic, transmitting thoughts directly. After attempting to sync his feelings with Shiro, Lloyd starts to see Shiro respond positively, surprising everyone. Shiro somehow manages to follow Lloyd's unspoken cues, running circles around him. Upon seeing this, Elise quickly saw Lloyd as a genius for linking minds with Shiro, unlike her simple approach of using love. This made Lloyd believe that love facilitates empathy with animals, making the connection easier. Moved by his words, Elise rushes to hug him, but Lloyd reminds Elise of the monster still causing havoc around the tower. After leaving the tower, Lloyd feels worn out but grateful for his newfound ability to communicate with monsters. But Silpha suggests focusing on sword training, however, Albert suddenly insists on involving Lloyd in some business. They soon meet Diane, the fourth prince, who doubts Lloyd's enchanting skills and wants to test Lloyd to confirm them firsthand. Albert then introduces Diane as a prince with an interest in enchantments and blacksmithing, praising his dedication to learning for the kingdom's sake. However, Diane still doubts Lloyd's enchanting abilities, not believing that he's beyond the foreign master sorcerers. He then challenges Lloyd to prove himself and expresses disappointment at Lloyd's dishonesty. Despite Diane's skepticism, Lloyd swiftly finishes enchanting the sword, leaving Diane astonished and unable to comprehend what he's witnessing. Albert, however, isn't surprised by Diane's reaction as he acknowledges Lloyd's exceptional skill. As Diane examines the layers of spells in Lloyd's enchantment, he reluctantly accepts Lloyd's talent and becomes excited about the possibility of creating ultimate spellbound weapons with Lloyd's assistance. Diane soon explains the concept of spellbound weapons, where magic is inscribed into the weapon during the smithing process, allowing for more advanced spells. He admits his lack of magical talent but expresses enthusiasm for creating weapons that enable everyone to use magic. Intrigued by the idea, Lloyd agrees to partner with Diane. They begin crafting a fire spellbound sword, with Diane envisioning a sword that emits flames upon swinging. Lloyd then suggests compressing the spell for an infernal fireball. But despite Diane's concerns about the lengthy incantation verse, Lloyd assures him he can compress the spell, presenting Diane with the result. As Lloyd and Diane continue their attempts to create the spellbound sword, they face repeated failures. Despite simplifying the enchantments, the spells just won't merge onto the steel. Lloyd is puzzled by the issue, with Grumor also expressing surprise at his difficulties. Diane then reveals that he purchased some cheap mana essence, which Lloyd found that it's lacking in hematide an essential component for spellbound weapons. Realizing they need more hematide, Lloyd plans to sneak into a dungeon to obtain it, but Silpha purposely suggests this out loud, prompting Lloyd to fake reluctance due to his royal status. However, Silpha reveals that the king has approved her request for Lloyd to broaden his horizons, including adventuring. She then proposes that Lloyd register at the Adventurer's Guild, taking his first steps as an adventurer. At the guild, they meet Katarina, who assists Lloyd with registration. She explains the assessment process and presents him a crystal ball to measure his abilities. Lloyd recalls a similar crystal from his previous life, knowing it will explode if his true abilities are revealed. He then tries to suppress his magic to undetectable levels, and he cautiously touches the crystal. To everyone's surprise, the crystal reveals he's an E-rank adventurer, the lowest rank. The other adventurers laugh at his low rank as even the most inept rookies usually receive a rank. Despite his suppressed magic, Katarina is impressed that Lloyd ranks A in magic. She suggests that he could one day rival the renowned Silver Blader, though the other adventurers scoff at the idea, unable to envision an E-rank reaching such heights. They doubt Lloyd could achieve the same fame as the Silver Blader, who conquered numerous dungeons before abruptly quitting adventuring. 
Ignoring the adventurers, Silpha asks Katarina if they can go on a dungeon run, but Katarina explains that Lloyd needs a B-rank adventurer in his party for that. Silpha then suggests that she re-register to meet the requirement, as it turns out that she was the Silver Blade. However, Katarina informs her that she would start from C-rank if she did so. But suddenly, Tao offers Lloyd her help, however, Silpha questions why she's not searching for Alberto. Tao then confesses that she was unable to find him and asks Lloyd to introduce her to Albert as a favor instead. Lloyd is surprised to learn that Tao is also an adventurer, but she explains that she did it by accident as her true purpose was to search for Alberto. Silpha agreed to her help, but she also mentions that she once faced tough foes, which was the Assassin Guild. They soon embark on dungeon runs to collect materials while Diane waits for Lloyd's return. The scene then shifts to Albert visiting Diane, expressing impatience. Diane notices that something might be wrong with the kingdom, which was most likely war but he assures him that they'll mass-produce the weapons once Lloyd returns. Suddenly, Lloyd arrives with a chest full of hematite, and they finally succeed in smithing the weapon. After crafting the sword, Diane tests it in the training room, where it blew up the whole training range, surprising everyone. Succeeding in their smithing quest, Diane started to mass-produce the weapons, although using a lesser fireball. Exhausted, Lloyd retires to bed, sensing something in the courtyard outside. He's surprised that Shiro didn't sense it, as he usually does, and looks out the window to see a masked boy standing there. The intruder initially attempts to flee upon being spotted by Lloyd, but he quickly encloses her within a barrier using his magic to prevent her escape. Lloyd then approaches her with a friendly demeanor, but the intruder, realizing she's been caught, sheds her disguise and triggers a spell she'd rather not use on children. Lloyd quickly senses the pleasant scent of her poison, but recognizes its potential danger, attempting to purify it with his spell. However, the intruder informs him that her poison cannot be cleansed by anyone. This intrigues Lloyd, realizing that the intruder's poison must be a unique, transmuted mana abnormality, a trait possessed by a select few individuals known as the Blighted. Despite being scorned by society, the intruder introduces herself as Ren, the Poison Muff. Lloyd, however, fascinated by her abilities, observes as she effortlessly breaks a portion of his barrier, marveling at her power. Ren assures Lloyd that he won't lose his life from the small amount of poison he's absorbed, but warns him of the pain he'll experience in the coming days. After bidding Lloyd farewell, Ren flies away into the night sky. But as the effects of her poison wear off, Lloyd reflects on her ability to mask her presence so effectively. Grimoire then reminds him that it's not the time to admire her, and Lloyd confirms that he's no longer affected by the poison, having healed himself with a healing spell. Lloyd then explains to Grimoire of his intention of letting Ren go so he could track her to the Assassin's Guild headquarters, which he learned about from Silpha the day before. He recalls Silpha mentioning the unique abilities of each Assassin, piquing his interest. Lloyd then begins to track Ren's movements, which amazes Grim as he can still detect her even when she completely removes her presence. Dressed up and ready to pursue Ren, Lloyd sets off while Silpha, armed and accompanied by Shiro, arrives in the courtyard, but is too late as Lloyd has already departed. Back at the headquarters, Ren reports back to her superior about being spotted and the castle's production of spellbound swords. She suggests that they may be preparing for war, but her superior dismisses her concerns, urging her not to emulate their former leader, Jade, as he is long gone. Ren, however, insists that Jade will return, but her superior disagrees. But as they argue, another assassin intervenes, warning them that they've been watched the entire time. Little Harry Potter then reveals himself, but Ren is surprised to see Lloyd moving freely despite her poison. Her superiors are also taken aback by Lloyd's abilities, realizing he's not just an ordinary kid. Another assassin becomes interested in Lloyd upon learning that the intruder is the seventh prince, who's responsible for the spellbound sword's mass production. Despite the assassin's warnings that he can't escape, Lloyd calmly approaches them, deactivating his barrier. Grimoire is puzzled by Lloyd's decision to leave himself vulnerable, but Lloyd explains that he wants to face the assassin's abilities head-on, not wanting to waste their unique powers. He assumes a martial arts stance ready to engage them, and instructs Grimoire to stay out of the fight. Grimoire, however, advises him to put up a barrier. But before he can finish his sentence, an assassin attacks Lloyd, inadvertently hitting Grimoire in the process. Lloyd successfully blocks the assassin's attacks using his cape and martial arts skills. Impressed by the assassin's fluid movements, Lloyd remains focused, using techniques he learned from Tao to keep up. The assassin, Introducing himself as Babylon, the Warp Blighted explains that his unique ability is to bend and move his body to fit through small spaces, earning him the nickname, the Giant Rat. Lloyd realizes that Babylon's warp abilities are unique as they don't rely on magic. But suddenly, another assassin named Crow appears and commands Lloyd to sink, causing Lloyd to feel heavy and fall to his knees. He then reveals himself as the Cursed Blighted, whose words are imbued with mana. 
which stopped him from speaking to avoid causing harm. Galilei, known as the Spider of the Web Blighted, attacks Lloyd with mucus-based abilities. However, Lloyd quickly breaks free from the white mucus and analyzes their abilities with a smile. Talia, the Pain Blighted, also attacks Lloyd, which she does by sharing her injuries with him. But Lloyd surprises everyone by healing both himself and Talia with a spell. As the assassins line up to face him, Lloyd shows no fear or shame, even with his willy dangling in the air. He continues to reinforce his blade with strength and adopts Silpha's sword techniques, initially surprising the assassins. Lloyd then attacks them with a deranged smile, taking down Babylon despite his body's softening ability. Crow and Galilei try to retaliate, but Lloyd avoids Crow's speech magic, causing it to affect Galilei instead. Lloyd also swiftly defeats Talia and sets his sights on Crow, wondering how he'll counterattack. Despite Crow's attempts to command him, Lloyd takes him down, feeling his body grow heavier in the process. Galilei, angered by Lloyd's actions, threatens him, but Lloyd remains focused on attacking Talia. Despite Talia's warning that harming her would hurt him due to their linked bodies, Lloyd shows her the power of gender equality, causing her pain but also experiencing a strange delight from her abilities. Galilei tries to restrain Lloyd, but he breaks free once again and sends Galilei flying into the wall. Lloyd is intrigued by their abilities and asks Ren to demonstrate hers, but she refuses, considering Lloyd a psychopath. He decides to approach her anyways, but Galilei quickly explains that none of them can fully control their powers. As Galilei attacks once more, Lloyd dodges and electrifies him with magic. Ren attacks Lloyd in retaliation, but he erects a barrier to block her poison. But it turns out, Galilei feels better due to Lloyd's spell. He sheds tears of joy as his curse has just been lifted. Lloyd then clarifies that his spell only grants control over their abilities, and doesn't remove them completely. He also offers to inscribe the rest of the assassins with the spell, and they gladly accept, relieved to finally have control over their mana. As Galilei begins to tell Lloyd the origin story of the Assassin's Guild, Lloyd initially shows disinterest, but eventually becomes intrigued. Galilei recounts how the guild was formed by Jade, their leader known as the Phantom Blighted, who possessed the ability to be teleported randomly across the world. One time, Jade returned after a long absence and inspired them with his vision of helping behind the scenes, leaving their emblem, a coin with a wolf head, at each job site to show the world their good purpose. However, as he was in the middle of his speech, Jay disappeared again, leaving the guild to deal with problems the Adventurer's Guild couldn't solve. Hearing this, Lloyd becomes intrigued by Jade's teleportation ability, but his attention is quickly diverted when a letter suddenly appears. It turns out to be from Jade, informing them that he's heading to the Lordos Domain. Some time later, Silpha arrives at the hideout and finds Lloyd's letter, which states that he will be going to the Lordos Domain with the Assassin's Guild. As she returns to Prince Albert, they discuss the contents of the letter together. Initially, this made Albert think that Lloyd was kidnapped by the Assassin Guild in conjunction with the Lordos clan, prompting him to consider war. However, upon further reflection and Silpha's agreement, they realize that Lloyd wouldn't allow himself to be captured and begins to suspect a different scenario. But suddenly, Silpha presents Albert with Lloyd's clothes, which were filled with an unusual white sticky substance. This enraged everyone in the room, causing Prince Albert to quickly declare war. While the carefree Lloyd continues to travel to the Lordos Domain with the Assassin Guild. The members of the Assassin Guild were taken aback when they saw their guild's emblem on the letter that had suddenly appeared. They were puzzled about its origin, and Galilei swiftly opened it. Inside, they found a message from Jade, their long-lost leader. Jade apologized for his prolonged absence and revealed that he had overthrown the rulers of Lordos who were preparing for war. He announced that he had become the Lord of Lordos and was ready to receive the guild members at the Lord's Manor. He also mentioned that he had prepared his celebration to welcome them and expressed his desire for them to live together as he had promised. The assassins were overjoyed to learn that Jade was alive and had kept his promise to them. In the present, Lloyd, using his abilities, was flying the assassins to Lordos, eager to see Jade. As they traveled, Lloyd recalled how Galilei had thanked him after reading the letter, expressing gratitude for the ability to control their curses and vowing to repay Lloyd for his help. Ren asked Lloyd to accompany them to Lordos suggesting that he could imprint the spell on Jade as well. Lloyd, however, curious about the origin of the letter, asked if she knew where it had come from. Ren explained that it had suddenly appeared out of nowhere. But Lloyd deduced that this meant the letter had been accurately teleported to their location, a feat that indicated mastery over Jade's powers. This realization led the others to conclude that Jade must have gained control over his power. This made Galilei wonder whether Jade had been lying about his inability to control his powers before, but the others reasoned that there would be no point in such lies. Despite their trust in Jade, Galilei questioned the authenticity of the letter. 
But Ren, however, insisted that Jade wouldn't want to trap them and suggested that he must have learned to control his abilities. Lloyd pointed out that if Jade could already control his power, there wouldn't be a need for him to tag along. Which saddened Ren, but Lloyd proceeded to reassure her, saying that he would still accompany them because teleportation intrigued him. He then noticed Ren's concern about the possibility of betrayal and promised to handle it if anything went wrong. This reassurance comforted the group and they expressed their relief and gratitude for Lloyd's decision to join them. Observing Ren's reaction, the others teased her, noticing that she was making the face of a maiden in love. As they land near Lordos, Lloyd notices the exhaustion of the others from the high-speed journey. Grumoir then suggests they walk the rest of the way if the others are too tired to fly, which Lloyd agreed to. Ren, however, volunteers to gather food from the woods and Babylon tells Lloyd that Ren is likely trying to impress him. Babylon then shares Ren's backstory, explaining how her poison accidentally killed her parents when she was young, leaving her to live alone in the forest. However, one day, Jade returned to the guild with Ren. He embraced her despite knowing the risks of her poison. But despite initial doubts from the others, Jade insisted on helping Ren, eventually creating clothes to contain her poison, which deeply moved Ren, who considered them family ever since. Lloyd then proceeds to observe Ren's cloak and expresses his interest in meeting Jade. Grimoire is surprised by Lloyd's curiosity about another human, but Ren prepares food for everyone, though it doesn't look appetizing. Babylon, however, suggests using Crow's cursed speech to enhance the taste, but Ren stops him, insisting her stew is good as it is. Teria also worries that the food might not suit Lloyd's taste, given his royal status, but Lloyd enjoys it, remarking that he's eaten worse things in his past life when he was poor. Despite the humble appearance of the meal, Lloyd appreciates the gesture and company of the group. Ren is delighted to see everyone enjoying her cooking and expresses her hope that Jade will have the chance to try it someday. She then recalls a time when Jade informed them that the Adventurer's Guild was considering lifting the bounties on their heads. Though the news brought joy to the group, Jade admitted that he needed to confess something to them. Jade revealed that he was actually the third son of Lordost, a noble family. He also confessed that he approached them to use their abilities in his efforts to prevent the impending war orchestrated by his family. Despite his revelation, the others were not surprised as they had anticipated his backstory to be along those lines. Galilee then reflected that they had all faced hardships and lived as outlaws for a reason. Jade assured them that he had no intention of involving them in any personal problems against his family. Instead, he emphasized the importance of their goal to earn the right to live normal lives. He acknowledged the blessings of their time together and expressed his desire for them to continue the Assassin Guild's mission, even in his absence. Jade also shared his dream of transforming Lordos into a haven where blighted individuals could live happily. He promised to return as the Lord of Lordost and fulfill this vision, urging his comrades to keep the guild alive and not give up on their dreams. As they approach Lordos, Grimm reflects on Jade's character, admiring him as an awesome individual. The scene then shifts to Lloyd sleeping while Galilee carries him, commenting on how ordinary he appears while resting. Grimm, however, notes the heavy-duty barrier protecting Lloyd even in his sleep. Ren also suggests letting Lloyd rest while they scout the manor, expressing concern that Jade might be manipulated by the Lordos family. The group agrees, considering the possibility and deciding to leave Lloyd under Grimm's watch. However, Grimm insists on accompanying them, feeling responsible for Lloyd's safety. Arriving at the manor, they find preparations underway for a party, prompting them to consider returning later with Lloyd. Despite their intentions, they are noticed by a resident who invites them inside. Welcome warmly, they are served fine cuisine, but as Grimm was about to leave, Ren requests Grimm to stay with her a while longer, feeling nervous about facing Jade again. When Jade finally arrives, they are relieved to see him well. He quickly changes into familiar clothes to put them at ease, impressing them with his mastery of teleportation. Ren then expresses her eagerness to talk with him, overwhelmed by the many things she wants to discuss. Suddenly, Jade reveals his true intentions and unleashes his power, which leaves the members of the Assassin Guild shocked and horrified. Jade's use of cursed speech surpasses even Crow's abilities, and they realize that something unusual is happening. Jade then reveals himself as a demonic figure named Gizarm, who boasts about his collection of blighted individuals and offers them as vessels for the demons inhabiting the manor. He points to Ren as a poison blighted and prepares to sacrifice her for the demons. But in a desperate attempt to stop him, Grimm attacks Jade with his magic and urges everyone to escape. However, Jade easily overpowers Grimm, leaving him wounded, landing beside the sleeping Lloyd, who wakes up to the chaos around him. As Lloyd learns about the situation from Grimm, they witness shadowy figures emerging from the bodies of the possessed individuals. Galilee recognizes them as psychic life forms capable of infecting and controlling humans. Jade, now identifying himself as Gazarim, reveals his true identity as a demon from the nether world. 
He explains that he sought Jade's body for its teleportation ability and spent months wearing down his mind to gain control. Despite Jade's resistance, Gazarum eventually succeeded using Jade's body to target his friends. Enraged and desperate, Ren confronts Gazarum, demanding to know what he did to Jade. But in response, Gazarum kicks her aside, revealing that Jade tried to end himself to protect his friends, but was healed every time. As Gazarum continues to taunt Ren and the other Blighted, he reveals the extent of his manipulation over their friend's body. Gazarum then proceeds to mention Ren's past to add to her pain, but soon notices the spell on her arm. He then demands information about the spell on Ren's arm, but Ren struggles to remain silent due to the cursed speech. Torn between loyalty to her friend and the overwhelming pressure from Gazarum's influence, she recalls the happy memories she shared with Jade, further strengthening her resolve to protect her friend's secrets. But just as Ren is on the verge of breaking, Lloyd suddenly arrives on the scene, using his formidable magical abilities to shield the assassin guild members with barriers and unleash a powerful spell that tears a hole in the manor. Ren is relieved to see Lloyd as he quickly heals her injury and demonstrates his care for her well-being. He urges the Blighted to flee, knowing they would only hinder his efforts against Gazarm. Initially, Ren hesitates to leave, but Galilei reminds her of the danger they face and the futility of fighting against such overwhelming odds. Meanwhile, Guzarm eliminates one of his own demons for questioning whether he was still alive. He then commands the remaining demons to pursue the assassins, recognizing their skill in evasion and the need to eliminate them before they become a threat again. Lloyd, undeterred by the odds stacked against him, confronts the demons head-on, demonstrating his determination to protect those in danger. But when faced with a deadly attack from two demons using cursed speech, Lloyd's quick thinking saves him as he dodges the attack, leading to the demise of one of the demons. However, Grimm warns Lloyd about the true nature of Gazarm's power, explaining that it bypasses conventional magical defenses and directly affects the victims. Despite understanding the gravity of the situation, Lloyd remains resolute in his determination to confront Gazarm and put an end to his reign of terror. Using his magic to analyze Gazarm's abilities, he then highlights the dangers it presents. He explains that Gazarm's manipulation of mana directly bypasses traditional barriers, likening it to water slipping through a sieve. This makes Gazarm's attacks far more dangerous and difficult to defend against compared to normal magic. Grimm's explanation further explains the threat. He clarifies that demons are ranked from the 10th to the 1st class, with higher classes being more formidable. While most of Gazarm's lackeys are weak 10th class demons easily handled by sorcery, Gazarm himself is a demon lord, a member of Netherworld royalty. Grimm warns Loy that even a hundred first-class demons would be no match for Gazarm, emphasizing his catastrophic power. Despite Grimm's insistence that Lloyd should run, Lloyd's determination to face Gazarm does not waver. As he approaches Gazarm, the demon lord questions his identity, vaguely recalling something about Lloyd from Jade's memories. Lloyd introduces himself as the seventh prince and expresses his regret that he never got the chance to meet Jade, blaming him for the situation. The confrontation between Lloyd and Gazarm intensifies as they exchange accusations. Gazarm dismisses Lloyd's interference as a disruption to his plans and lair, while Lloyd argues that Gazarm's pursuit of the Assassin Guild, who represent new frontiers and sorcery, is the true main issue. Grimm, deeply concerned, advises Lloyd to retreat again, emphasizing the overwhelming odds against them. He explains that using sorcery against a demon like Gazarm is akin to trying to attack a fish with water. While high-pressure mana might affect lesser demons, Gazarm, who thrives in the depths of sorcery, finds such attacks as mere annoyances. Gazarm then demonstrates his power by launching a barrage of mana arrows at Lloyd, effortlessly piercing multiple layers of Lloyd's barrier. Despite this, Lloyd manages to dodge most of the arrows, though some almost penetrating his defenses. Gazarm teleports above Lloyd, breaking his barrier with a kick, and then attacks with more arrows. Lloyd, however, responds with earth magic, erecting a shield to block the onslaught. The Assassin Guild, witnessing the battle, is awestruck by the display of power from both the monsters. The demons, meanwhile, refocus on their original mission to capture the Assassins. Seeing this, Galilei urges Babylon to quickly open the gates of the fort to facilitate their escape. As the fight progresses, Grimm's fear intensifies, especially after seeing Gazarm easily break through Lloyd's defenses. Gazarm, however, is surprised that Lloyd remains unharmed and realizes that the only thing Lloyd reacted to was his teleportation magic. Lloyd then points out that this ability doesn't truly belong to Gazarm, implying it's stolen from Jade. However, Gazarm arrogantly claims that Jade lacked the necessary control over the power, whereas he, a demon born as a master of mana, finds it trivial to wield. He explains that while humans need abstractions and spells to master such abilities, his kind are already proficient, making complex sorcery simple for them. He compares the Blighted to birds born with wings but lacking the wisdom to use them effectively. 
He believes that the Blighted should offer themselves as vessels for demons as they are even hated and feared by their own kind. Gazarm sees this as the Blighted's path to perfection and intends to demonstrate it to Lloyd. He then attacks Lloyd with teleported arrows, embedding them into Lloyd's body and revealing that he named the arrows after Jade. Meanwhile, Galilee uses his sticky thread magic to temporarily restrain the demon lackeys, buying time for the Assassin Guild to escape. Despite their efforts, the demons manage to free themselves just as Babylon opens the gates for the guild to flee. Ren and Crow head to the other side of the gate, but before the rest can follow, the demons threaten to pursue them. Teria takes matters into her own hands, using her powers to hurt all the demons at once by injuring herself, while urging the others to hide in the forest and hide their presence there. As Teria prepares to sacrifice herself to take down the demons, Galilee insists on staying by her side to support her. He closes the gate to prevent the demons from escaping and offers his assistance to Teria in her final stand. Despite Ren's protests, Teria is determined to show the demons the extent of their capabilities and the resolve they possess. As Teria attempts to sever her own head to unleash a lethal blow against the demons, Galilee fends off their attacks to protect her. Ren desperately tries to convince Teria to reconsider, reminding her of their newfound control over their curses and the hope for a better future. However, Teria remains resolute in her decision. As Gazarm observes Lloyd's clone crumbling to pieces, he realizes that it was merely a decoy. Followed by Lloyd's sudden attack, almost slashing Gazarm using his sword. However, Gazarm effortlessly evades Lloyd's attack and continues to taunt Lloyd. But despite Lloyd's determination, he senses something that could potentially go bad and proposes relocating the fight to another location. The arrival of the Solemn Army brings a sudden shift in the conflict. Led by Silpha, Albert, and Dian, the soldiers engage the demons in combat. Albert, realizing the unexpected turn of events, seeks to locate his brother, Loy, and orders the Spellbound Sword unit to join him in rescuing him from the midst of the chaos. As Albert orders his warriors to advance and vanquish any demons that stand in their path, Ren sobs with relief at the sight of reinforcements. Meanwhile, we are shown a flashback where Silpha, determined to improve her combat abilities, takes her sword to the training ground. She swiftly strikes at a hay bale that is magically compressed, but her sword always bends when she puts too much strength into her swing. Despite cutting through the hay bale, she isn't satisfied, knowing that in a real fight she can afford to hold back against stronger opponents. Back at the battle, Prince Albert and his reinforcements arrive, much to Ren's relief. Crow, however, recognizes Silpha from a previous encounter. But the relief is short-lived as Albert and Silpha turn their attention to the Assassin's Guild, accusing them of kidnapping Lloyd. Diane suggests prioritizing the demons, but Silpha insists on dealing with the Assassin's Guild first, believing they need to end their supposed evil plans. She then threatens the Guild members with her sword, demanding to know Lloyd's whereabouts. But Galilee immediately spills the beans, informing her that Lloyd is fighting in the manor. Prince Albert, curious about Lloyd's opponent, learns from Taria that Lloyd is fighting a demon on their behalf, and as Ren attempts to provide more details, Babylon quickly silences her reminding her of their promise to Lloyd to keep his powers a secret. Ren recalls Lloyd's request during their time in the forest, where he asked them to keep his powers hidden from his family. He explained that standing out would hinder his learning of sorcery. Committed to their promise, Babylon insists they reveal as little as possible to Silpha. Silpha, unconvinced by their vague answers, grows impatient. She prepares to make Ren her first victim, demanding the truth. Ren, panicked, quickly tells her that Lloyd is fighting a no-name demon in the castle, with every Assassin's Guild member backing her story. But Silpha remains skeptical and advances on Ren, ready to make her the first victim. However, Prince Albert stops Silpha, and the Assassin's Guild members feel a fleeting sense of gratitude, believing he is convinced by their story. He then reveals Lloyd's underwear, claiming it's a lie that Lloyd would fight for people who hung up his underwear as a warning. Galilee awkwardly explains that Lloyd's underwear was stained with a white substance, so they had to wash and hang it up to dry. Hearing this, Silpha and Albert grow even more infuriated by this explanation and nearly go berserk. Ren quickly steps in, explaining their gratitude for Albert's aid and acknowledging the difficulty of gaining his trust. She tells them that the demons destroyed her family and the Assassin's Guild became her new family, explaining that the demons took Jade, an integral part of their family, which is why Loy is fighting for them. Her sincerity surprises everyone, but the moment is interrupted when the demon suddenly attacks. Elias swiftly deals with the demon using her Fenrir, impressing the members of the Assassin's Guild. Elias then assures Silpha that she believes Ren's story as Luru, her Fenrir, would have attacked Ren if she had any ill intent. Elder decides to trust Luru's instincts and focuses on the demon Horde, while Silpha is tasked with rescuing Lloyd. 
Ren realizes that Silpha discovering Lloyd's powers would break their promise and tries to convince Silpha that Lloyd is fighting a low-level demon. Silpha, however, threatens to hurt Ren if she doesn't let her go. Just then, a magic circle appears overhead, and a beam shoots out, destroying the bridge. Diane then points out that the demons are swimming towards the coast, and Albert realizes they are in a dangerous position if the demons get behind them, ordering everyone back to the coast. Meanwhile, Disarm, sensing the shift in the battlefield, taunts Lloyd, asking if he's pleased that Silpha won't be coming for him. He points out that he can't keep his eyes off Lloyd even when chaos surrounds them. Gazarm then launches a sudden attack, but Lloyd dodges and takes to the air. Grimoire soon notices Lloyd wielding a sword and wonders about his plan. Back at the coast, Albert's relentless fire attacks frustrate the demons who beg for mercy, knowing they can't regenerate under the constant assault. But despite Diane's massive fireball attack, the demons remain resilient. He expresses his concern to Albert, noting that their troops will deplete their mana reserves if they continue their barrage while also pointing out that sending Liru and Silpha into the mess isn't viable as it might endanger them. Albert, realizing the validity of Diane's concerns, looks around for Silpha and notices her absence. Meanwhile, on the bridge, Silpha and Shiro aims to reach Lloyd. Gaule, however, warns her that Shiro might not make the jump, and she acknowledges this, deciding to let Shiro jump with a rope. However, Shiro, eager to reunite with Lloyd, leaps without the rope, plunging into the water below. Seeing this, Silpha resolves to make the jump herself, but Gaule suggests she help Albert instead. But suddenly, a demon climbs up the broken bridge and attacks Silpha. She skillfully blocks the attacks, and the demon, impressed by her swordsmanship, reveals he is a rank 8 demon, higher than those she has previously faced. He boasts about being a master of a demonic blade form and vows to defeat her. Silpha, surprised that demons have ranks, wonders where the previous demon she fought would rank. She offers the demon some advice, but he dismisses her, arrogantly stating that even a mosquito is more intimidating. She then points out that he has some poop on his head, infuriating him and sending him into a fit of rage. Back at the battle, the troops continue their fireball barrage, but Albert grows increasingly concerned about the possessed bodies of the people of Lost. As he contemplates a way to save them, a demon suddenly ambushes him from behind, catching him by surprise. He tried to draw out his sword, but it was too late. However, Babylon intervenes swiftly, incapacitating the demon effortlessly. Though grateful, Albert is taken aback by Babylon's readiness to take a life. Babylon compares Albert's kindness to Jade's, noting their refusal to disrespect life despite being outcasts. He explains that their enemies are beyond salvation, as their hearts are consumed by the demons, rendering them little more than demons in human guise. Albert appreciates Babylon's insight and strides towards the demon horde with determination. Apologizing to the people of Lordos for being late, Albert begins casting a powerful spell to free them from demonic possession. Flames cascade from the sky, engulfing the demons as Albert urges the troops forward without hesitation. Exhaustion threatens to overwhelm him, but Diane lends her support as they charge into battle, and Albert warns his comrades not to allow the demons any respite from their onslaught. Back at the bridge, Silpha confronts the demon head-on, parrying his attacks skillfully. Despite their matched prowess, the demon regenerates swiftly, claiming that demons can push human bodies beyond their natural limits. The demon sets his sights on possessing Silpha, intrigued by her abilities. He showcases mastery of various sword techniques, attributing them to the skills of the body's previous owner. Continuing to taunt Silpha, he claims that humans are merely vessels for demons, vowing to wear her down until she's nothing but tatters. Gaule is angered at the demon's disregard for human life, but the demon dismisses his anger. Silpha, seizing the moment, leaps into action, unleashing a demon blade technique that catches the demon off guard. Though he manages to block it, he's taken aback by Silpha's being able to use it as well. Silpha then reveals that she learned the technique simply by observing him, mocking his reliance on acquiring new techniques through possessing new bodies. She then calls upon Shiro, who has returned and retrieves a sword specially crafted for her by Lloyd. Brandishing the sword named Demon Bane, Silpha recalls the moment when Lloyd and Diane presented it to her as thanks for her assistance in crafting enchanted swords. They designed it to withstand her full strength, ensuring it could take down a demon with a single powerful strike. Lloyd's thoughtful gesture was to help her overcome her tendency to hold back in battle. Drawing Demon Bane from its scabbard, Silpha defies the demon's assertion that she cannot defeat demons. He reveals the demon's sinister plan to plunge the country into chaos for their own amusement, using a declaration of war to lure Jade back to his hometown. The members of the Assassin's Guild vow revenge for being manipulated, but Silpha intervenes, determined to thwart the demon's schemes. With resolve, she assumes her stance, prompting the demon to unleash his most advanced technique. 
Meeting his attack head-on, Silpha executes her own technique flawlessly, effortlessly vanquishing the demon to the astonishment of onlookers. The story rewinds to the moments before Jade's death, where Jade, facing his end, declares that he has finally accomplished something significant. Gazarim, sensing Jade's weakness, asks if he has made peace with his death. With his final breath, Jade warns Gazarim that he won't get away with his actions and that he is destined to lose. He finally dies and Gazarim fully takes control of his body. As Gazarm assimilates Jade's power and memories, he discovers Jade's friends embedded deeply within his consciousness, preventing him from accessing something even deeper. Intrigued but unable to delve further, Gazarm is interrupted by a sword demon who congratulates him on his newfound control. A sword demon asks for their next move, and Gazarm, knowing Jade's aversion to war, decides to start a massive conflict. Returning to the present, Silpha sits beside the body of the sword demon. She comments on the formidable skill the previous owner must have had and expresses a desire to have sparred with him using his Lordo style. Noticing Ren crying, Silpha asks if she knew the fallen swordsman. Ren, despite not knowing him, feels a sense of sorrow, believing he found peace in the end. Upon seeing this, Silpha suggests that the group isn't suited for assassination, while Galilee and Crow realize that Silpha is actually the renowned Silver Blade. Suddenly, the lake's water turns to steam, causing shock among the group. Meanwhile above, Lloyd hovers, trying to see through the dense steam. He recalls being bombarded by Gazarm's mana spears, which could easily penetrate his barriers. Realizing he must maintain a reinforced barrier at all times, Lloyd understands that Gazarm's cursed speech can also travel through these spears, complicating his defense strategy. Lloyd identifies that he must not only block the attacks but also keep moving to avoid the dangerous Shadow Wolf attack. Noting that if he slows down for more than two seconds, Gazarin will lock onto him with this lethal assault. He quickly evaluates his options, realizing that if he were in Gazarim's place, he would continue an all-out offensive until his target exhausted their stamina. This aggressive strategy annoys Lloyd, prompting him to switch to attacking. Lloyd then employs double casting, deploying a fire spell in under two seconds. While Gazarim knows the fire wouldn't kill him, he still dodges to avoid his clothes burning. The misfire spell then evaporates the entire river, surprising Lloyd. Back in the present, Loy uses his spatial detection K technique to search for Gazarim, knowing he needs to track him constantly due to the Shadow Wolf's teleportation ability. He finds Gazarim and wonders about his positioning. Grim, however, warns Lloyd to keep moving, but Lloyd questions why Gazarim didn't attack him during his brief stop. He speculates that Gazarim might be using his line of sight to locate targets, implying the steam can be advantageous for Lloyd. He then stops moving, causing Grim to worry. But to their surprise, no attacks come. Lloyd deduces that Gazarm indeed needs to see his target to attack and decides that he must get close enough to attack with his sword. On the other hand, Gazarm, unable to see through the steam, waits for Lloyd to reveal himself. Lloyd then employs his strategy using earth clones, each wielding swords, causing Gazarm, who's unable to distinguish the real one, to face a barrage of attacks. He eventually identifies the real Lloyd by the feel of a real sword. Remarking that Lloyd's use of physical attacks is futile, he explains that magic and physical attacks won't affect him due to his regeneration ability. He recounts how he dealt with Jade's suicide attempts, and how he can harden his body to be as tough as iron, before revealing that he allowed Lloyd to stab him only to identify the real one among the clones. Gazarm acknowledges Lloyd's cleverness in managing to harm his body even for an instant. However, he realizes that the Lloyd he just killed was another clone and that Lloyd had given his real sword to one of the clones, making it difficult to identify the real Lloyd. Gazarm then calculates that the safest position for Lloyd should be above, where he would have a strategic view of the battlefield, but is taken by surprise when the real Lloyd attacks him from the left with fire magic. Lloyd continues to shuffle his position with his clones, creating confusion for Gazarm. But despite Gazarm's ability to teleport without seeing his destination, he is unable to teleport to uncertain locations, which means Lloyd's decoys have effectively neutralized his Shadow Wolf ability. However, he notes that his clones are limited to basic movements, but he has a plan to use them effectively. Gazarm then counters by using his mana spears to attack all the clones, but one of his spears is stopped by a heavy-duty barrier. Assuming the Lloyd inside the barrier is the real one, Gazarm attacks relentlessly, only to discover that it is another fake. Realizing that some decoys were given barriers while others do not, Gazarm concludes that the real Lloyd must be among the shielded ones, as running around without protection in this onslaught would be idiotic. This made him find the battle more entertaining than fighting a demonic legion, and speculates that the Seventh Prince must also feel similarly. However, in reality, Loy uses a spell to hide his presence, allowing him to close in on Gazarm while dodging attacks. He doesn't have a barrier around him, which worries Grimm, who wonders what Lloyd is trying to achieve by taking such a risk. 
Grim then recalls Lloyd explaining that his sword has the ability called Spelltaker, which can absorb spells and either analyze them or use them to increase their mana, which would help him study all kinds of magic. Lloyd, having successfully analyzed Gazarm's Shadow Wolf spell, cuts through the teleportation magic with his sword. Amazed at Lloyd's audacity, Grim notes that Lloyd is the biggest magic maniac he knows. He acknowledges that Lloyd's relentless pursuit of undiscovered magic drives him forward, making him the only person Grimm has ever truly respected. As Lloyd finishes analyzing the Shadow Wolf spell, he disperses his clones, revealing his real self. Gazar, noticing Lloyd's bloody cheek and lack of a barrier, realizes that Lloyd had been hiding using a spell. Puzzled by Lloyd's determination, Gazar asks why he continues to fight. He assumes it can't be out of pity for the others and suggests that Lloyd is broken like him and invites Lloyd to join him in conquering the world. To his surprise, Lloyd dismisses the offer, calling Gazarm's methods boring and plain. He explains that while humans may be weak, their struggles drive them to create incredible things and magic as a prime example of this limitless potential and infinite interest. Gazarm, angered by Lloyd's explanation, attacks with his shadow wolf. However, Lloyd counters by punching Gazarm in the gut using his key techniques. He explains that he used sorcery to enhance his lungs and increase the key in his attack, emphasizing that sorcery evolves by learning from all fields of knowledge and phenomena. Gazarm, infuriated by Lloyd's confidence, wonders how Lloyd knew where he would teleport. Lloyd, undeterred, challenges Gazarm to show him something new, urging him to get back on his feet. Angered by a human rushing him, Gazarm feels his pride wounded and prepares for another round of combat. Lloyd continues his relentless assault on Gazarm, each strike driving home the realization that he is not just powerful, but also deeply strategic. Gazarm's attempts to use Shadow Wolf for teleportation are consistently thwarted, with Lloyd accurately predicting and countering each move. It recalls the moment when Jade, with his last breath, told Gazarm he was going to lose. This memory shakes Gazarm, fueling his determination to prove Jade wrong. Filled with desperation, he launches another Shadow Wolf attack, but Lloyd continues to counter him, delivering a series of powerful blows. He sends Gazarm flying with a magic attack, directing him towards a hole filled with magma which Lloyd had created earlier. As Lloyd pummels Gazarm, he reflects on his lifelong fascination with magic. He recalls how spell books have always ignited his imagination, making him wonder of the creators of those spells. These flashbacks were not just idle thoughts as they drove him to seek out people like Jade, individuals who embody the pinnacle of magic. He taunts Gazarm, questioning if he has truly run out of ideas and expresses disappointment, declaring that if Gazarm cannot present a new challenge, he will have to die. Despite his battered state, Gazarm warns Lloyd not to underestimate him and explains the difference between a demon and a demon lord. Harnessing the ability to freely control atmospheric mana, Gazarm conjures a massive sphere of mana, proclaiming that no barrier or spell can withstand this attack. But Lloyd effortlessly makes the mortal dark sphere vanish, leaving him astonished that someone like Lloyd could neutralize his powerful attack so easily. Lloyd then explains that he used a spell called Void, a technique similar to the mortal dark sphere that casts targets into another dimension, reducing them to dust. However, the only difference between their spells is the name. Gazarm refuses to believe that Lloyd, a mere human, can wield such a formidable spell. Lloyd then recounts his past experiments, where he collided two instances of void spells out of curiosity. But the spell simply vanished upon collision, leaving him disappointed, much like how he feels about Gazarm now. Enraged by Lloyd's nonchalance and power, Gazarm declares that having more mana doesn't make Lloyd any less of a trash, and attempts to take possession of Lloyd's body to utilize his immense mana pool. As Gazarm touches Lloyd, he is overwhelmed by the boundless mana within Lloyd. Unfazed, Lloyd questions whether he would die if hit with Void and proceeds to launch several Void spells, with one of the spells successfully hitting Gazarm. Meanwhile, Albert and Diane struggle to fight the demons in the steam created by Lloyd's earlier attacks. But Diane suggests that the steam might be hindering the demons as well, giving them an advantage. This is also the case for Leru, Shiro, and Silpha, who can use their enhanced senses to track and defeat the enemy. Silpha, however, notices the demons moving sluttishly and detects a sweet scent in the air. But suddenly, Ren warns everyone not to breathe in deeply, and she has released her poison into the air. She then ensures that it doesn't reach her allies, but admits she doesn't have perfect control over it yet. Albert, unable to see clearly in the dense steam, muses that they might have better visibility if the sun were up, but as he checks the time, he is surprised as the sun should already be up by now. Yayan, however, mentions that this is caused by the steam, but the Assassin's Guild members notice that the darkness above isn't the night sky, but Lloyd's mana spreading around. Meanwhile, Gazarm is being drawn into the Void spell and struggles to resist, 
but the spell absorbs any mana he tries to use. He considers abandoning his body but soon finds he can't escape. Desperate, he pretends to be Jade, claiming he has regained control and pleading with Lloyd to stop the attack. However, Lloyd isn't fooled and casts another Void spell from the opposite side, crushing Gazarm between the two spells. As Lloyd suppresses his mana, the sun finally breaks through, illuminating the battlefield. Where suddenly, Jade's spirit appears, thanking Lloyd and Grimm. Seeing this, Ren recalls a conversation where Jade shared an urban legend about the Seventh Prince. He mentioned that on the day the prince was born, celebratory fireworks went off early, which was rumored to be due to a spell cast by the prince at birth. Initially, Galilee dismissed it as ridiculous gossip, but Jade found it fascinating. He hoped that if such a magical prodigy existed, they might lift them out of their curses and into the light. The scene shifts to Lloyd creating a grand grave for Jade, but Grimm questions why it's so far from the others and Lloyd explains that it's more of a memorial. He soon expresses admiration for Lloyd's successful use of the Void spell, noting its slow movement. But Lloyd credits his success to deciphering Shadow Wolf, which allowed him to detect when it was used. By linking this detection with his reflexes, he could automatically dodge and cast Void in response. Grimm can't believe that Lloyd was able to figure out a complex spell like Shadow Wolf while toying with Gazarm and Lloyd mentions that Gazarm was strong and admits it was foolish to try deciphering the spell in the middle of battle. But he needed to if he wanted to land an attack, as he wouldn't have been satisfied if he couldn't figure out the spell. However, all of this was only possible because Shadow Wolf was clearly laid out for him. He explains that at the end of his life, Jade actually managed to transcribe a complete spell for Shadow Wolf, leaving it behind thinking someone would rise to the challenge of overcoming it. He then humbly states that it wasn't him who won the fight, but it was Jade. Hearing this, Ren is moved to tears and thinks she needs to tell Lloyd how grateful she is. Albert then approaches Lloyd and asks whose grave it is, but soon realizes that it's the grave of the former leader of the Assassin's Guild and the previous ruler of Lordost, Jade. He reveals that he knows the whole story, stating that after learning of Jade's revolt, the Assassin's Guild came to Lloyd, an expert in sorcery, for help dealing with Jade. However, when they arrived, they encountered a horde of demons, and one of them was wearing Jade's body. He then continues by saying that the Assassin's Guild has told him how they've lived and their ambitions, Albert then mentions that he is proud of his little brother for helping them and for defeating a demon on his own. But he reminds him that things are not that simple. The members of the Assassin's Guild have been taken into custody, and Ren will be joining them once found. Explaining that they are residents of the Underworld who killed for a living and effectively kidnapped a member of the royal family, dragging him into a war which are serious charges. However, the Assassin's Guild has said they want to make amends by serving Lloyd for the rest of their lives, and if that's not possible, they are ready to accept any punishment deemed necessary, leaving the decision to Lloyd. Albert tells Lloyd that this isn't like adopting a pet, as when these outlaws become his retainers and commit some blunder, Lloyd will be held responsible. He soon asks Lloyd for his decision, but Lloyd states that everything Albert said is quite reasonable and that he will take them under his wing, promising to take full responsibility for their actions. He accepts Lloyd's determination and tells Lloyd that being the seventh prince doesn't mean people don't care for him reminding him that he shouldn't be so distant and should ask for help if he ever needs it, as before being a prince, he is Albert's little brother. However, Tao suddenly comes running having heard that Lloyd was in trouble only to find that the battle is over and everyone is safe. Embarrassed, she tries to run away, but Albert instructs Silpha to stop her, as they still haven't thanked her for her help the other day. She then chases after Tao, ensuring she doesn't leave. Grimm then comments to Lloyd about his kindness in helping the Assassin's Guild, but Lloyd explains that he helped them because they embody potential new frontiers for magic, and he doesn't want any more possibilities like that to be snuffed out. After successfully capturing Tao, the soldiers release the members of the Assassin's Guild, and the Guild members express their gratitude and pledge to serve Lloyd with all their might. The scene then transitions to a tea party, a request from Tao as her reward. However, Tao feels uneasy having a tea party beside a grave and is nervous being around so many princes and princesses. But Albert reassures her that it's just a casual gathering and encourages her to enjoy herself. Albert then also tells the members of the Assassin's Guild to relax and enjoy the gathering in their own way. Initially unsure, they soon start a chaotic celebration, drinking and mourning Jade in their style. Witnessing their lively spirit, Albert then suggests having a similar party at the palace someday. Teria then asks Albert if he's going to have any drinks, but he declines, citing his royal duties. However, disliking his formal approach, Teria uses her power to share being drunk with Albert, allowing him to let loose. This causes him to recall that Galilee still hasn't explained how Lloyd ended up covered in his white fluids and becomes angry at him. 
The scene then transitions to our beautiful mommy Sylpha, Ren, and Elise who are taking a dip in the hot springs created after Lloyd's fight. There, Sylpha asks Ren if she has something to say as she follow them there. Ren then soon reveals that she wants to work alongside Lloyd and be near him to show her gratitude, promising not to disappoint him. But Sylpha advises her that she must ask Lloyd directly. Lloyd, who had been brought along by Sylpha to clean up, overhears their conversation and agrees to Ren's request. Surprised to see Lloyd there, Ren expresses her doubts about being accepted, due to her past actions and being poison blighted. But Lloyd reassures her, saying that she needs to stop calling herself blighted and understand her natural-born strength. He then suggests that by studying her poison, she could become a pharmacist and save lives, turning her poison into medicine. Later, back at the castle, Ren begins serving as Lloyd's maid alongside Sylpha and Albert, creates a cover story for the king to keep Lloyd out of trouble, allowing Lloyd to continue his magical research. The anime then ends here with Lloyd pleased that his true power remains undiscovered, enabling him to pursue his passion for magic. Thank you for watching the full recap of this anime. If you enjoyed this video and want more of it, go ahead and hit that like button down below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Let's grow this community into a huge one and help us reach the goal of hitting 5,000 subscribers.